Good luck. Hello, everybody. My name is Lat Mackey, and this is Sequence Break, a podcast that features conversations with speedrunners, developers, content creators, and everything in between. Welcome to a bonus episode. And kind of excited to share this one with you. You may have seen it already. It was part of a show that I used to host on the Games Done Quick channel as part of the GDQ Hotfix. It was called Games Done Classic, where we looked back at legendary moments with the legends that made them happen. And this was part of an episode all about like classic Zelda games, basically the Zelda games that were on the NES console. And it kind of is really timed perfectly because I've been grinding a lot of Zelda 2 myself. And if you've been listening to the podcast for any amount of time, any amount of time, you know that I kind of have a thing for Zelda 2. <laughs> Eon's been on the podcast. Feasel's been on the podcast. We have done a whole episode just dedicated uh, and devoted to Zelda 2. I'm a fan. And it's kind of interesting that I've really never taken that plunge into speedrunning it until recently. Probably only been doing it for about a month. And I've finished about 13 or 14 runs. And this has all been on the Famicom Disk System version, which is, I think, actually a really good way to start learning the speedrun. Uh, for somebody like me who wasn't as good or as familiar with the combat in Zelda 2. And so the FDS version, when you're speedrunning this, you get attack eight really early on. And if you aren't familiar with Zelda 2, then this episode's actually going to be probably really good for you. It's kind of a classic look. So we actually looked back at, oh, let's see, it looks like Feasel's Zelda 2 run from Awesome Games Done Quick 2013. And Eon joined the conversation. It was really kind of a nice way to kind of bridge the old school with the new school and how have things changed and what do we look at nowadays, as well as including a breakdown of the conversation as well. If, if you've watched any GDQ for any amount of time, you, you may be familiar with Breakdown. Uh, he seems like he ends up like on, I don't know, a, a couch or couches every single year at GDQs. And this year, uh, if you're listening to this in 2022, he's actually going to be uh, running a game again at uh, SGDQ uh, this year, which is our return back to live this year. So pretty excited about it. And uh, I, I was thinking about this recently because of having so much fun uh, learning the speed run of Zelda 2. And it, it's also kind of triggered these things about uh, some of the things we've talked about on the podcast before where like learning a new speed run and there's something great about this like first month or these first few attempts that you're putting in because probably because like you're just like bleeding time off of it <laughs> as if there was like as if you're like hey i'm really getting good at the game and uh you, knowing that you know there's still a lot of work in front of you and i'm, I'm facing that right now with l2 i'm like man i i, I got to start learning some of these optimizations and some of the you know the speed running strats for it that actually will help me uh push my time down further and try to get this thing closer to you know a, a respect Respectable run, if you will. I, I do have to say, though, I'm really enjoying it, and I, I think you're really, I, and I really hope that you enjoy this conversation uh, as part of uh, Games and Classic. Uh, for about, a, let's see, this was recorded back in June of 2021, so it, it's a bit dated, but not really because this run was done back in 2013. So information still, you know, the the, the reliving of the moments is, is still present. So hope you enjoy this bonus episode. Let's take a look back at Zelda 2 with Fiesel, Breakdown, and Eon. And welcome back to Games Done Classic. My name is Lat Mackey. This is where we look back at legendary GDQ moments with the legends that made them happen. And we are talking all about Zelda 1 and Zelda 2. And right now, we are going to start with our Z2 discussion, The Adventure of Link, and the history of the speed run of the game, but also its appearances here at a GDQ. And I'd like to first welcome back Breakdown and Fiesel, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it, guys. <laughs> and then also bring it in uh, somebody you haven't seen on the panel yet. And this is Eon, current Zelda 2 speedrunner. Uh, and I would, uh, how do we describe <laughs> Eon? Just, you know so much and play the game so well. Uh, thank you so much for being here and chatting all about Zelda 2. Really do appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I love this game. <laughs> It, I, it's really important, I think, too, to have, you know, as Joel was, we're going to turn learn, uh, Eon is still actively running the game, and I think that's going to help bring a really interesting and good perspective to what we're going to see here today. I'm actually just going to, this run that you're seeing on screen, this is from AGDQ 2013, but I'd first like to take us back a little bit. We talked about it early on in the show. Uh, Breakdown, tell us a little bit, uh, what was the community like? How long had you been speedrunning the game when we first saw it in 2010? Give us set the stage a little bit historically speaking as far as Zelda 2 goes. Uh, I mean the community 
not that dissimilar to Zelda 1. There were a few more active runners for Zelda 2 um, back when I got into the game. This would have been back in 2006. Uh, it was the very first game I decided to set down a speed run, and I kind of did it independently and then found out that there were other people who did this too. Um, so there was basically a little bit of scatter between Speed Demos Archive and Twin Galaxies. Um, <laughs> so that was the, still a uh, thing. Yeah, Twin Galaxies was definitely still a thing. Um, there was, I don't know, you could call it a rivalry, I guess, between the sites. It definitely people had like you know their home base on the internet, and they would defend it to the death. But... Um, Let's see, the Twin Galaxies folks were mostly more guarded with their strats, and, well, they didn't actually have to do video verification. And uh, let's see, the word acrimonious popped up a few times in the Zelda <laughs> 1 section. That happened to Zelda 2 as well. Um, on the uh, SDA side of things, uh, there were a few active runners. Uh, let's see, there was, um, let's see, Tommy Montgomery had the um, no up a death, well, no up a no death abuse record uh, recently set. He did have one death uh, in the lead up to the um, Final Palace. Um, but it was deemed not to help him, so they let it through as a no-death abuse thing. Um, and that was a category that I thought was neat, so that was the one that I played. Um, I got my, my very first deathless run through the game was the one I submitted. It was like a 117, and that was the time on the site for a good four years, something like that. There were a few other categories, like um, I believe MDI had the um, New Game Plus record at the time. I forget the time on it. Um, and then there was um, an update death abuse run by, I think, TSA, though that brings us back into the acrimonious realm of things. <laughs> um, so, but not really like an active, like thriving community for right. the game at that point in time by any stretch of the imagination. Um, basically, I set my time and then didn't really pick up the game until the lead up to CGDQ. Um, it was uh, one of my favorites. It was probably my single favorite Zelda game at the time I decided to run it. Um, but uh, it didn't really feel much need to push it further once I got the time. It's just like, okay, I did it. I'm done. And, yeah, that's basically how that went at that time. Uh, then some other runners came into the scene. Uh, Arctic Eagle, um, let's see, was the first one to really start incorporating, like, uh, Candleless Death Mountain for the hammer and things like that. Um, and that brings us into, like, the early 2010s, like, late aughts, early 2010s. Um, and then, well, we get to people who are active in the call starting to emerge. <laughs> and, yeah, that was kind of the early state of things for Zelda 2 speedrunning. Thank you for the perfect segue there. Uh, uh, Fiesel, um, you, you know, when did you pick up the game? What may, We talked a little bit about it in the first segment. And what led you to start grinding the way you did with this game? Because uh, you're one of the first, or are you one of the earliest runners I remember watch, being able to watch your grind live and, in per, you know, on, on, I don't know if it was Twitch originally, but, you know, back at that time period. Uh, yeah, there wasn't really, to my knowledge, anyone streaming Zelda 2 at that time. So really, it just started with me uh, really just kind of picking it up for fun because I I was very inspired by what I was seeing on SDA, you know, the runs from uh, the runs that, that Breakdown mentioned and Arctic Eagle in particular was really brought some new stuff that, that no one had really thought of to the table. Uh, it was very inspiring. And then that Dark Death Mountain was key. Like that, I thought, was the most impressive thing. Uh, you know, very hard section of the game to do that right at the very outset with, you know, very little going on and no candle. Um, I thought that was really impressive and I wanted to learn that. And so my uh, running of the game kind of expanded from there. I started out just kind of learning that part and then, you know, started racing people. And and then I, you know, started working on just trying to get, um, you know, see if I could take a record in the game because there were already a couple of different categories evolving at the time. I mean, most people... We're pretty focused on uh, any percent deathless or any percent no death abuse uh, at that time. Uh, that was really thought to be sort of the main category of the game, the best category of the game, uh, because uh, which you know is actually kind of odd because I actually kind of like the the version with up A and with intentional deaths and game overs and things. Um, this I think there's actually more strategy to that, but there's a lot of strategy when you're not allowed to take a death and not allowed to you know use an up A or anything your experience routing may, makes a bigger difference. And the experience routing really was, is kind of like the, really the best thing about, about writing that game. The most interesting thing is routing your experience. And it was such a more complex problem when you do the game Deathless. So that's what we were all really interested in at the time. And I think the first two times I ran it, you're seeing the second time I ran it, I ran it uh, SGDQ 2012. 
Um, we actually did no candle is the category officially. <laughs> that was a, a donation incentive. Um, you know, if the goal was met, I run it without the candle, which it was, and I did. And then this is the second time I ran it. Uh, this just about six months later, HDQ 2013. So I was probably a little more comfortable with it in this one. Um, but yeah, that was uh, really the category everyone was very interested in. And then uh, other categories started to come up. People got interested in the 100% in the all keys and the any percent with up A. And then eventually the, the glitch, once we found the healer glitch, um, a couple of us really just started working on it to see if we could, how fast we could beat it, you know, with all the glitches. I'm not quite sure who to throw this question to, so I will ask it just to the panel. Um, if you look at the leaderboards nowadays, just kind of comparing Z1 and Z2, Z1 has quite a few more submissions than Z2. Z2 is it can be a bit, so for some reason, it's still a bit controversial as far as a Zelda game and the difference it has between the some of the other games in the series, and we can get to that in a second. But is that still the case at this time? I mean, we're, we're, was the you breakdown, you kind of set the stage a little bit. As as the popularity starts to grow a little bit, did Z2 and Z1, did they kind of stay the same or was it dwarfed by one or the other, you know, that kind of thing? I'd say once Zelda 1 started picking up steam, it definitely overtook Zelda 2 in terms of speed running popularity. Yeah. It's um, kind of just not really debatable. It's just basically a fact. Um, <laughs> yeah. Zelda 2, it's like it's very much its own game. It's different than the other entries, like the 2D yes. entries in the series, because what well, you have like you know the side-scrolling 2D combat and the experience routing, the live system. It's very much a different game, and it attracts a different kind of player. Like just because you're a fan of Zelda games doesn't necessarily mean you're a fan of this game. So it just draws a different player pool. Yeah, back then, this was like the bad Zelda game. Like, that's, <laughs> it was kind of, the rep I mean, that's sort of the reason why yeah. I picked it up is because, you know, I was running like Deadly Towers and like some, some games of, of real, you know, questionable quality. And, but I'm like, I love this. I really, this was my favorite, one of my favorite games as a kid. And I'm like, man, why everyone really hating on this game? <laughs> everyone, you know, why, how did that happen? I'm definitely going to have to run it. I think that made me want to run it more. The fact that it was just this bizarre, weird Zelda with no resemblance to the other members of the series. I think that's actually kind of what got me into speedrunning this game and just being as loud a proponent for it as I was at the time is like with the rise of the internet and message boards <laughs> and things like that. People like just like t dumping on this game. I'm like, no, I, I love this game. It was one of my right. very first NES games. I have like deep seated nostalgia for this game. And it's just like, no, no, this is my favorite Zelda and I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. And of course, when it came time to pick my first speedrunning game, it's like, yeah, Zelda 2, because it's the best. The best. Come at me. <laughs> Period. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's going to be a bit of bias here because uh, even though I don't run, uh, speed run Z2, it's one of my favorite games of all time. And I'm going to, I love the way that you've all described it. I'm going to ask this question of Eon as well. What makes the speed run of Z2 so interesting and kind of so great from your perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, the combat in the game is just so fun. Uh, the, it's real satisfying to do it well. And just the way that, the physics of the game works out. The movement on the side-scrolling sections is just very satisfying and the way that you can, you know, do things like if you s stab the wall with your sword, it repositions you so you can use that to take advantage of different things. Or like if you have beams, you can like jump and shoot a beam behind you and then keep going forward without losing momentum. Stuff like that makes for really cool uh, combat tech, so. Yeah, it controls so well. Like the game, it it feels so good controlling the character. Like they really just knocked it out of the park with play control. Yeah, and just just like Ian says, like they they added the physics are perfect. There's just the right amount of momentum that you can be attacking backwards without losing, uh, without losing you know your speed. Uh, you know, having high and low attacks. Uh, there's like shields that will you can bounce off of, and some enemies have shields or hard parts that you can bounce off of in certain ways. And the way you bounce depends on exactly the angle you approach the thing at. So there's just a lot of nuance you can get with, with some little minor adjustments to your timing. Uh, so yeah, the physics really is what, what nails it, uh, I think, above anything else. Uh, that's a really good point. And one of the things we didn't actually get into too much in the Z1 conversation was the difficulty ramp and how that game, if you're, especially if you're playing it from a casual perspective, the difficulty really ramps up towards the last two or three dungeons. In this game, it seems like you kind of get it right away. <laughs> like it, it, 
casual or as the speed run, it just it seems to play as a really challenging game. And I don't know if that was off putting at the time for certain people as well. I know it can be, especially NES hard. You know, this one, this game could definitely is one of those games that comes to mind when you think about <laughs> the NES challenge of games back in the eight bit era. Uh, does the speed run and I'll, this is to Fiesel, actually the whole panel. Um, you know, does the speed run have some of those same sort of difficulty spikes? Is it right all at you at once? I mean, what's the challenge uh, as far as the speed run goes? Dodging yeah. those okay. stupid overworld enemies. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when you're, it, it's sort of different when you're a new speedrunner versus an experienced speedrunner. So, um, as an experienced runner, there's not really any part that's all that super challenging anymore. But, like, you know, when people are learning the game, uh, particularly uh, the 100% all keys category is what people usually start with. Uh, Death Mountain is the first real big difficulty spike in that. Um, and then uh, Great Palace, obviously, and Valley of Death are, are two other difficulty spikes for when you're learning it. And then if you're learning uh, a category that does Dark Death Mountain, that's a huge difficulty spike as well. So We uh, we talked about... Yeah, I think... Go ahead, Beasel, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're good, please. The, sir, I think survivability is the tough is, mm. is the tough thing for a lot of people starting out. And so, yeah, as, as Ian said, like the re, like a good accessible entry into it is the 100% all keys because you're doing all the dungeons, you're doing it in a pretty typical order. So you're not really going, you know, out, out of the, the difficulty curve and you have a lot of hearts and experience to work with. So that's kind of like survivability. Once you get past that, I think the thing that really is challenging is when you're when you're watching your time and you're really starting to bring your time down. Then you start to run into this wall of like, am I manipulating the overworld enemies right? Am I, you know, all these little things that you're doing, like little things add up all over the place, even in just the way that you attack enemies. You can find if you do something wrong, you'll be losing little bits of time all over the place. Um, but yeah, you kind of hit a different plateau once you really become serious about your times. Uh, you'll hit a different plateau where you feel like you're getting better, but your times just don't improve because you like will lose huge chunks of it to an extra encounter here or there. Things like that. I'm curious about some of the evolution of the speedrun itself, too. You know, we got a chance a little bit to talk about routing and some of those things. Fusel at this time, I mean, and Breakdown as well, I mean, were were there new routes being discovered? How would you kind of, you know, develop a game plan around this game? Because so much can change, it seems like, in-game with the experience and all those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, the, the experience is, routing the experience is kind of the, the biggest thing for you, because you make so much experience by playing the palaces right, by ending the palaces at the right spot. In order to get up to a, you know, a decent uh, levels to be able to do the, the great palace efficiently, everything has to go right in each of your palaces and your drops have to be in the right place. And there's so many different ways of doing it. Like, I don't know, like I would just spend days and days just pouring over spreadsheets. I would just mark down all the enemies on the way, how much you know? What what group do they count as? How much are they worth? What targets do I need to hit? But that's that's kind of the biggest thing that really constrains it is how you're going to do your your leveling. Um, but the other thing that I, I I found really started to make a difference, especially like maybe in the later years of it, when I was kind of moving into like my Zelda two retirement, um, people got a lot better at manipulating overworld encounters, and I think that ended up, that part of the routing ended up really starting to take off. Um, I did the uh, the up a uh, any percent up a run, and the nice thing about that, I, I started working on it. The nice thing about that is the overworld RNG resets every time you up a, or returns to a known state. So um, you actually have the ability to plan out what you're going to do in the overworld as well, assuming you can play very consistently. And um, you know, I kind of I was inspired a lot by Arctic Eagle. Arctic Eagle figured a lot of this stuff out. Uh, and it was there in, in his videos and people just didn't even like realize what he was doing and why did it turn out so well for him until they, you know, until, you know, I and other people really started to like look at it and be like, oh, this thing that I thought that I figured out myself, Arctic Eagle was already doing that. So, you know, that was, that was a kind of a big thing, but that's like taken off and people really can manipulate so much now. It's amazing. And Ian could probably talk more about that 
as she yeah. worked on the game a bit later than I did on average. And just to yeah, chime in real there's... quick, it's like you know, it. watching newer runners like dodge <laughs> enemy encounters is something that just blows my mind. It really does. It's just like, oh my goodness, mm. like how? Like I'm actually going back to like my original runs of this game, like, you know, I was actually planning on random encounters a little bit for parts of my experience route. And it's just like, okay, I'm gonna grab like fifty from random encounters on this walk and that's gonna get me where I need to be. <laughs> and uh, well that's bad. That's slow. So um but gonna let Eon go now. And talk Please, more about the yeah. of how, how we how got here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no, there's uh, a neat discovery uh, like about two years ago where um, with specifically the overworld random encounters, uh, they actually exist in two different states, one where they sort of random walk around and one where they home in on Link. And we can kind of manipulate which state they're going to spawn in based on the amount of time you spend on the last screen before exiting to the overworld. And so if you watch like modern runs, you'll see runners like doing sword stabs before they exit a screen or reading a sign before they leave town. Uh, and all that is to just uh, wait a known amount of time so that the encounters move and behave in the way that we want them to so that we can either avoid taking an encounter or take an encounter over a... Um, fixed overworld encounter space so it, it, it's kind of cool i mean that's kind of wild that that's what it's evolved to <laughs> I, I you know one of the things you all mentioned is early on is sharing ideas and things over sda but feasel you mentioned that you know people didn't know what others were doing at times and and so so not everyone was participating it sounds like in the small amount of leaderboard or places or message boards the places that had to communicate in the first place so you still yeah. I mean, the thing about using uh, pre pre streaming, the thing about using SDA to collaborate was, you know, not a lot of people had the ability to just like upload their works in progress right. to YouTube or to wherever. So there was a long turnaround on things. So you would pack a lot of new things into a run, and you would grind it out to get the time that you wanted. You put this video up. It would take a couple of months to process and post, and then everyone would just be like kind of just be this deluge of new information as everyone digested this new run that came out. And then you as the runner, sometimes people will point out something really dumb, like, oh, hey, why didn't you just do that? You could have saved five seconds. And you're like, oh, man, why didn't, like, why didn't you tell me this six months ago? But, you know, it, this, the, the feedback cycle has gotten a lot quicker now that, now that everybody who's doing world record attempt streams, it's like, if you're doing something wrong, everyone will tell you. So that's, that actually helps. Yeah, being Gotta able to like see, the internet. <laughs> being able to see the improvements in real time is definitely like a huge change from how things were done like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's it basically like any like work in progress speed run basically came down to how talkative the person who was doing it wanted to be on the forums. Like I can tell you right now, basically anytime I was working on a run, basically I would do a session and then basically post a blog on SDA is basically what I do it. I'd throw up a wall of text in whatever game thread it was. And everybody did that. It's just every once in a while, it's just like, oh, I didn't even know this was in the works, and all of a sudden, it's on the front page, and it's like, oh wow, look at that. And then maybe they post it, yeah, hi, thanks, I did this. Look, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and that would be like the extent of what you would see about it on the forums. Um, and you'd also run into instances where people didn't really understand what exactly they were doing, but they knew it worked, like they didn't know why, and so they wouldn't like you were basically at the mercy of their ability to explain it until you could actually see the final product. So definitely the flow of information was slower back in the day. Uh, on the very first episode of this uh, show, uh, Frezzy man, Freddie Anderson, he was in Sweden and he was talking about having to mail his VHS tapes across the pond <laughs> to Texas or to wherever SDA was located at the time. And so not to bed, you know, you, you, the flow of information, obviously just a, <laughs> Uh, not quite what it is today where we can see things nearly instantly. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really impressive and, and, and kind of great to see where it's come because we can share these strats and, and people can start to learn things at, at a lot quicker rate than they used to be able to. <laughs> um, uh, Fiesel, what was the most popular category at this time? What, what, what is the run that NZ2 that people are running the most? Uh, well, at, at first it was just any percent deathless just because everyone thought that was kind of like the flagship category. That's, you know, that's the that's the main one, um, but as soon as as soon as anyone really started to put effort into 100% all keys, that really took over. It ends up just being a real fun race, very accessible to new players. You know, uh, that that's really the main category now. Yeah, uh, Ian, I'm gonna actually throw that question over to you. Why has that category become the one that's really resonated, at least with the most amount of runners trying it out for the first time? 
Yeah, I think um, a big part of that has to do with, um, you know, doing a deathless run of Zelda 2 is really difficult. <laughs> um, so uh, I think a lot of people are, even with the all keys category, people are still intimidated by this run because that has the one credit clear requirement as well. And so um, sometimes we try to push people to, and I, I've really tried to push people when they're learning to do the 100% no major glitches category, uh, which you can route it like all keys if you want, but you can also take game overs or up A's and stuff. And so you could take advantage of those scripted walks that Fiesel was talking about earlier uh, when you up A and get that RNG back to a known state. So um, it's, but yeah, it's uh, really just more approachable to be able to take some deaths, intentional or otherwise. And uh, also getting the candle, that's a thing that really intimidates people is uh, <laughs> if they're going to skip the candle, uh, not a lot of people actually want to do that. So you see the, the number of times on the leaderboard drop off sharply when it's a category that's routed without the candle. So. Uh, so I was going to ask you about that. Uh, it, it, oh, I'm sorry, breakdown. Were you going to say something? I'm sorry. I was just going to say full disclosure to date. I have never done Death Mountain without the candle. Never bothered to learn it. <laughs> it's intimidating. I agree with you. I'm totally right there with you. Uh, Fiesel, it's the same as in the light. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's really not that bad. Thing. Honestly, Jump Cave in the Dark is harder than Death Mountain in the Dark. Yes. And what is that Absolutely. exactly? Could you, would you mind describing that a little bit? Sure. So the big thing is the Gurria enemy under the low ceiling. Uh, the way that they throw the boomerangs, it's a random pattern and you can't always get a good read on where they're going to throw the next boomerang. And so, and you're also in there with uh, attack one and life one. So um, they hit hard and uh, it's real easy to take a, a quick death in jump cave. Going through this run we've, we've been watching for a little while now, there's you still don't have the candle yet. There's still quite a few places that are not lit up. Uh, when you're in a live setting like this, Fiesel, are you able to see what you can see at home on your own setup and things like that? Can you see things moving on the ground and stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, so what's actually happening, the way you're able to see is the sprites are replaced with a black palette. So all the colors are turned black. And there are some places where the sprite overlaps with the... Uh, with the ground a little bit, like the hitbox where you walk on the ground doesn't exactly match the visual edge of the ground. So you see this tiny little like flicker of a few black pixels at the foot of uh, a dark enemy. And that is as long as you, as long as the TV, that you're sitting close enough to the TV to see that. And as long as, you know, it doesn't have weird like color and contrast settings or something like that. It's not so, it's not so bad. That's really the only cue you, you use. But after a while, I mean, you barely even use that just because you know there's only certain... I mean, the enemies aren't random. The enemies are going to be in the same places every time. I mean, sure, you don't know which way the bats went when they swooped, but there's still, even those things, a couple of different possibilities. And so eventually, you just... You know exactly what's where, and you don't really need to see it. And you know what it's doing because the enemies attack at a certain rate that you can predict. Um, and so... Like, it looks really like, you know, like this white knuckle thing, but like really once you've done it enough times, it isn't any different. Like, I don't realize that I'm fighting in the dark any more than I would realize I'm fighting in the light in a palace or something like that. You don't think about it. Breakdown, I got a question for you. As you've seen some of these things start to evolve and some of these new strats, is there a strat or, or a route or something that happened in the game where you thought just completely changed the game or never could have imagined seeing the game move in that direction starting from uh, way back when to where it is now? Let's see. Well, people actually like going for Death Mountain in the dark. Like that was definitely like the big <laughs> like change for the category that I played. In terms of like more recent strats, like I'm not sure if I'd call it like you know a game changer for the route, but just something that blows my mind every time I see it is the eco boost in Palace Five. Like that just it always impresses the heck out of me every time I see it. As yeah, no, I would have loved to have known about that back in the day, and it looks so smooth. And it's basically just boosting. People off one of the bubble enemies yeah. to uh, skip a use of fairy at the start of palace five. And it's just like, that's so smooth. It's uh, every single time I see it, I'm just like, yes, that's awesome. So yeah, that's the coolest trick. Like it doesn't even look possible. <laughs> no. you know, yeah. It's once people do it consistently, the way people jackhammer too, like some of the fights mm -hmm. where people use jackhammer technique, I would never have thought that it was possible to do it 
Oh yeah, it's one of those like blue people do. blue iron knuckles. Like right. leading up to like, you know, a pound. The double hits. Yeah. Just like just straight just drill through them. It's yeah, that's right. really Or like the Palace looking. Five boss. You just go like careening into his hitbox and just and the boss dies. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. The people who do that well. That was a boss I always treated with fear and respect. So it's nice to see him just get wrecked every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, the it's, Barbara Strat too. Barbara Drill Strat's mm-hmm. a good one. So. Oh yeah. It's fun to watch people who, uh, even on casual playthroughs, who don't know anything about the game, because you'll, you'll you, they won't even think to try the jackhammering on on certain enemies and this and that, and it's really become kind of a cornerstone now of some <laughs> of some of the things you do in the game. Uh, yeah, and I heard you mention I found your stream very early on when I got into Zelda two and things like that, and you also you mentioned if you were considering trying out this speedrun on your own about how learn how to play the game and the mechanics and how Link reacts to certain things and stuff like first and it seems like that's a really great way to you know take on some of the er early hurdles of this game why is that important and what are some of those mechanics that are important to learn early on in the speed run so combat is is huge like Fiesel mentioned before about survivability being uh the big hurdle to completing speed runs and the biggest factor in uh your survivability is avoiding damage and you do that best by uh killing enemies quickly. And the the shorter they're alive, the less chance they have to hurt you. And um, so learning the combat and realizing how basically every enemy you kind of need to approach in a slightly different way. And I think that's a, a thing where people get frustrated with the game is you can't attack, you know, the Dyra's the same way that you attack the Iron Knuckles, the same way that you attack the Stalfos and, and stuff like that. So uh, really taking the time to try out different uh, combat strats against different enemies and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, that's that's really the biggest thing, I would say. Yeah, the, being able to read the enemies is really important because, the, yeah, uh, like Ian says, they're, they're, every enemy behaves completely different. You approach it completely differently. And they're not stupid enemies. Like, all the enemies in the game are, like, for what they do, are pretty smart, and they all have their own little thing going on. And just you got to recognize that some of the enemies will back, whether the enemy backs up or moves forward depends on what you do. Um, Just knowing, like, the rate at which they're going to attack, paying attention to whether their guard is high and low on, you know, the enemies that have shields and things like that. And uh, learning what what are the squishy parts and what are the hard parts of the enemies. Because the hitboxes are a little different, and you know the way that you approach them is a little different. Uh, but knowing exactly where to hit them, and you'll bounce off different enemies different ways. So really, just spend a lot of time, like with like very careful combat, just like paying attention to what's happening and reading how the enemy responds. And then learn that, like in the air, you can like attack like crouching or not crouching, and those are completely different and have completely different uses. So little things like that make a big difference. Yeah. Fiesel, as we're watching your run, one of the things that is abundantly obvious is that you do have really good control over Link. And um, it's one of the things that struck me right away. And I'm wondering, did you have access to save states and the things, modern tools that we use nowadays to learn how to play this game? Like, how did you learn and, and put in the time to get this good at the game? Oh, yeah, save states. I mean, as early, like, I started speedrunning in 2007 and I, you know, even then I was doing my practicing on uh, on emulator just be, and I was save stating constantly and I would just, you know, I would just make myself a, a directory of just like 50 different locations that were tough. And, you know, every day when I would practice, I would just load up each save state and I would grind it until I got that trick 10 times and I moved to the next one. Like that's, it was all very short loop practice. That's how I really did most of my my learning. I found that to be the most effective thing. Um, so yeah, I would short loop practice all the different parts of the run and, you know, anything that I failed at, I would make a note to do more of that the next day. And it was only after a lot of practice that I ever actually try stringing it together and doing runs. So by the time anyone saw me streaming anything, or by the time anyone saw a video of mine, you're like, you're kind of missing all the, <laughs> the trial and error work that went into it. Right. You know? Uh, I think this is kind of uh, an interesting time period too, because if you watch Zelda Two speedrunning today, there there are many wonderful categories that didn't exist back then, and then also the runs itself. We have new strats, we have new things. Um, Ian, can you perhaps touch upon some of the things that uh, for this category that have changed or that have evolved since uh, Fusel did this way back in 2013? So, yeah, is this? So I haven't noticed any updates. Was this just any percent? 
uh, basically deathless or what this was This is the, deathless, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's right. So I honestly don't know that a lot has really substantially changed about this one beyond minor things like, uh, well, actually eco key wasn't even, isn't necessary because you don't need that key, but the overworld uh, manipulations that we've got now um, is the big thing. Um, yes. Yeah, beyond that, I don't really know a, a ton. Like, cool. I mean, I know... Uh, going through, I don't know if you get the spell spell uh, and use that in Dark Valley of Death, but the top uh, runs these days yeah. will use beam strats in in there and just not get the spell spell at all, which is real scary to do uh, Valley of Death right. in the dark without the spell spell. Because you, I don't remember if I actually got spell spell. I might have done it just for marathon safety, but okay. you, I mean, I wasn't supposed to. I mean, it's not a thing that sure. you were supposed to get then. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So th I mean, if that was going on at this time that's not a new development either so uh yeah this <laughs> cool. this category is like the route has been pretty optimized for a while i think yeah the the categories that allow glitches really are the things that have kind of blown up because this like not long after this so maybe it was around this time where people started doing the uh, uh you know to using the the wrong warps and things like that uh, and that, you know, you don't use any of that in this run, but there were other categories where people started to use all kinds of different, you know, the fairy feet and things, like all kinds of different glitches that, yeah. that no one was using before. So that's kind of where it started to develop after this. I actually wanted to ask about that. And, you know, Fiesel, this point had, had, you know, had the scroll lock and all that kind of stuff been discovered or is that about to be discovered? Where is that in the history of Zelda 2 speedrunning? <laughs> It's around, we're looking at uh, early 2013 right now. It's around then. Um, there was a forum post, I forget, there was a couple of people who were involved in this. There was a forum post and, by someone who was a runner and then of the game and then someone else who were talking about it. And everyone was saying, oh, this is something that could be done. I actually did a run of it on stream. I think it was the first time that I know of that anyone actually completed the game. And I, it was like 30 minutes or something like that yeah. um, using that. And then that was the last time I ever did it because I didn't. I didn't like trying to get the dumb healer glitch over and over again. I know. Um, but after that, people started to find all kinds of different things that you could do, and the the glitch categories just started to get real good. Yeah, I know you did a run also with um, doing an any percent glitched without the healer glitch, where you used the HUD fairy in Darunia to get to Glitch Town. Oh yeah, uh, that's right off that roof there. Yep. Yeah, which that getting to Glitch Town that way was actually in a old Nintendo Power magazine. <laughs> wow, yeah, I didn't know. I missed that. Yeah. I would like to touch upon that because, you know, we, we have these categories with those things. How, I mean, Ian, could you give us a little maybe historical perspective? How did those type of things change the game? Like, what did the healer glitch do? What did it, How did that, you know, or sure. you know, did, what did that do to the game? So healer glitch does a couple things. It lets you, uh, right away, it lets you wrong warp from the uh, nearest town to start to King's Tomb, which lets you get into the back door of Death Mountain. Um, and so you can get the hammer in like three minutes, um, which is uh, versus like if you go the route that Fiesel went here, it's I didn't see the time on this, but I know people can get it in about nine minutes, uh, mm. the hammer without uh, the healer glitch. So uh, that saves a good chunk of time. But then you can also you can also do uh, a stack overflow uh, memory corruption to set up a state that we call uh, scroll lock. And what that does is the game's only supposed to allow you to enter up to two doors at a time uh, before you have to exit a door to go out. And so it uses a data structure called a stack for that. Um, but if you get to Glitch Town, all the doors point back to Glitch Town. So then you can enter more than two doors and then it starts uh, writing to areas in memory that it's not supposed to be able to. Um, and one of the things that that does is it impact, it writes over some memory that the game uses to know how wide screens are. And then that has the impact of, in a lot of cases, preventing the screen from scrolling to the left, which lets you exit on the left side of the screen with the screen scrolled to positions where you shouldn't be able to exit to the left. <laughs> and then that lets you uh, effectively exit out either the down exit or the up exit on a screen. Uh, and that has the impact of in caves, uh, it does like uh, entrance index math to point you to the exit when you exit from there. 
And so that's how you can wrong warp from Spectacle Rock over to Maze Island. Um, and when you're in palaces, you can uh, go around all s sorts of different ways without needing to unlock doors and without, like, um, uh, you can also, like, wrong warp between palaces from from that. So uh, it really just, uh, you know, the any percent route is, um, it's a very short run that it's, you know, 17 and a half minutes now and um, gets the bare minimum. But then if you look at something like the 100% glitched or the reverse boss order, where there are much longer glitched categories and you see uh, a different example of, of how that scroll lock is applied, because depending which doors you enter in, you can have different effects on things. Um, and then uh, you get to see, uh, you know, wrong warping in between palaces to save time for different things and um, all kinds of really cool stuff. So, Brick, I'm going to kind of bring this back to you once again. When <laughs> when you first started running the game or putting this game out there, did you imagine that things like this, there was a potential to have these see these kind of discoveries happen for this game? I had no idea this game was nearly as broken as it could be, certainly. <laughs> so, no. It's in terms of, like, you know, the glitch to any percent. Like, I was just as surprised as anybody when those strats came to light. Um, it led to some really cool categories, though. And it's like, I mean, we got Eon on the call here. That RBO run a couple of uh, oh, GDQs so ago cool. was a treat. That yes. was a treat. Thanks. That was a fun one to watch. Um, and yeah, no, that just something like that being possible. Like, the game doesn't want you to go into the Great Palace first. It doesn't want you to do that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Thunderbird first is... Um, the fact that that can be done is um, not something I ever would have thought possible. But it was cool to see. Yeah, uh, and it's... I would say it's actually a testament to how well the game is programmed, the fact that we can break it apart as badly as we can, and it doesn't crash. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what still blows my mind about it, that, you know, there's supposed to be these barriers for you to be able to go from one palace to the other, and the game says, hey, you know what, it, we're, we're gonna, it's going to keep going. That's so wild to me. Uh, there's there's so, so uh, just to kind of get a, a feel for this, um, you know, nowadays when we watch a run on GDQ, um, it's obviously it's been practiced and a lot of times there are commentators who, because these communities have grown, we have people who can commentate on the run. Some If the runner wants to participate or if they want to focus on the game, they can kind of choose to go that route if they want to. Uh, Fiesel, tell us a little bit about like preparing or, or you know, showing this game off, uh, you know, like did the, the previous GDQ and then this one in 2013. Um, had you put any thought into the preparation of it? Because you were one of, that I can remember, one of those earlier speedrunners who was streaming live. Live. So, how, did you put any thought or any, you know, any work into that side of things? Like, as far as improving my commentary <laughs> game rather than just focusing on not dying. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you were you able to find people who could speak about the yeah. game while you're running and things like that too? Yeah. So by this time, 2013, that was after I started streaming and having a microphone. Like, it was a lot harder for me the first the first like two GDQs that I was in because I really wasn't a streamer then and it was like I found that once I started doing it on a regular basis, that kind of got easier and I didn't really have to think about it. Uh, I generally didn't prepare commentary. Um, it was just kind of on the spot and I was relying on the couch commentators and it looks like I've got some good ones there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I never really thought much about the commentary aspect of it. It just came a little bit more naturally. Uh, you know, just the more you stream, it gets easier. Many of us who played this game specifically as a kid know how challenging it can be. And so there is something, and maybe all of you could speak on this, I don't know, but being there live watching a Zelda 2 run, but also watching it on the stream, it always seems like at any moment you could just die. It's one of those runs that keeps me on the edge. It could be because I love the game, obviously. That could obviously be a big part of it. But uh, do you feel that kind of same sort of uh, suspense or, or do you feel like you're on the edge of the seat when you're doing this, Fiesel? Or at this point, have you gotten comfortable enough the game where you were pretty confident with what you could do? Oh, no. Anytime there's a room with a bot and lava, <laughs> anything can happen. Bots are jerks. Yeah. Confirmed. No, and yeah. In case people, for people who don't play this, they're very random. Like those, those little low-tier enemies, the little tiny slimes, the little blue and red slimes and stuff are the most obnoxious enemy in the whole game. Because all the more sophisticated enemies, they have a little bit of AI going on, they're trying to do a certain thing. The bots, they'll just like sit there quivering and you think, okay, they're gonna do, no he's gonna do nothing this time. And you approach and it just like jumps at you out of nowhere and knocks you in. So that's by far the most vicious enemy. And that can happen anytime and it does not matter how good you are. The Yeah, you can die at any point. 
One thing I should point out about the route here, I do notice something that diverges from the modern route on this category is Bezel did boots first and then left Palace 4 to go get the Reflect spell. Uh, typically now, uh, Palace 4 is done in one shot, so the runners would get the Reflect spell before getting the boots. So. Speaking of that, Ian, as we move into the more modern era of speedrunning of Zelda 2, what are some of the things that, you know, differentiate a, you know, dude's uh, world record run compared to what we're, you know, is it is it skill? Is there RNG? What's the, how does one, uh, you know, crack that top 10 of, you know, upper echelon of runners? Sure. So it's, I mean... First thing is, no one is as practiced as Dude is. <laughs> he puts <laughs> more time into this game than anyone, I think. Um, but uh, no, the other thing is, like, uh, the overworld, um, he spent so much time on learning to read and react to the overworld spawns. And the, the overworld enemies spawn on a step count as well as a frame count. And so... Um, it's important to develop sort of an internal sense for when those two things are going to trigger. Um, and so then you know when to stop to be able to read and react to what they're doing. Um, and so uh, avoiding taking those overworld uh, encounters is huge because, you know, they take uh, seven seconds for one of them. You take 10 overworld encounters, that's a minute. So um, there's that. There's also... Uh, anytime you take damage, that's at least a second and a half time loss. So not taking damage and then just efficient combat on the enemies and the bosses that you do kill. So It's come quite a, a long way. And, you know, Fiesel, when you stopped running the game, um, I, I, life takes over, of course. Uh, I'm curious if you could have foreseen or or did you did you guess that the game could be broken or, or you know... Um, figured out the way that it has been uh, when you stopped running the game. I mean, by the time I started kind of like phasing Zelda 2 out of my repertoire, uh, like Simple Dude and Pro JN were, were, you know, already total rock stars <laughs> of the Zelda 2 scene. And I think at that point, I was just kind of like went numb to being impressed with like how <laughs> much the things can prove. Because like literally mm -hmm. every week, it would just be like JN or, or, or Dude doing something completely insane that right. I've never seen before uh, and it, yeah so like I definitely knew it was still going places just by the competition between those two and the other people and it was around that time like 2015 or 16 ish that there were a lot more people coming in the it was like the top 10 on the leaderboards were filling up with names that I didn't even know like a lot of people were just inspired by seeing the GDQ runs by watching Simple Dude and Pro Jan and all that doing their thing. Like a lot of people were coming onto the scene around then. And I I definitely, I would say in this case, I did expect that the game was going to be taken to places that I wouldn't have expected just because, you know, just with so much new input, so much input and so much talent, of course. Eon, you know, we, we are still seeing people grind this game. I mean, uh, and, and so it seems to be, are, are we still... Are there still things to discover? Are there still things that can happen in the varying categories for this speed run? Or, you know, tell what, what, what could be the possibility of some of the future for this game? For sure. I think um, that there's definitely still stuff to be discovered. Just last year, uh, there was a big discovery that uh, um, improved a bunch of the up A categories um, where uh, it was basically... Uh, doing some work on the randomizer, it was discovered that... So you can place the gem into the statue after beating a boss. Uh, and for speedruns, we would... Um, if you didn't need the experience for a level up in certain cases, um, you might do an up A before the gem hits the top and the experience starts counting up and, and you get the level up and stuff. Um, and that was also real common in the randomizer that people would do that. Uh, but it was discovered that if you up A before the gem hits the top of the statue, you can go back to that statue and place another gem. And so uh, you could uh, effectively go fight Horsehead, place the gem, up A, and just place all six gems there right at the start. And then you've placed all the gems, and now you just need the items to let you get into Great Palace. And so um, we've termed that gem duping. Um, but... Uh, 
yeah, effectively you're you're duping the gems that you can put into a single statue. Um, so that was a really neat thing that changed a lot of the like no major glitches categories uh, in that where um, we don't actually have to go into all of the palaces. <laughs> <laughs> like you just don't even see Palace right. Six at all anymore in some of those categories. Uh, I do have to ask because we just saw a moment, and I, I don't mean to change the subject too drastically here, but what the heck just happened there, <laughs> uh, Fiesel, during that boss fight? Because it looked like you almost died. It was very close. Uh, which is it, the Carrick fight? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, what happened was I'm. I don't know if this is something that's changed, but when I was running this, you know, you could you could you know time your first hit. And after that, it was just random what was going to happen next. I don't know if there's any manipulation. Yeah. But, I mean, if you if your strategy is to go into a corner and crouch, if Karak just keeps appearing on top of you, you know, it's over. Yeah. So that one was just out of my hands. You just cross your fingers. But maybe it's gotten better since then. Well, so there has been some research into the RNG about stuff like this. There's been, like, um, you know, there's a, a route that we do in the all keys where we get shield after Palace 2 because that allows for... Um, a manipulation where you can get the bubble skip, uh, and skip the bubble encounter on the way to the heart container and on the way leaving the heart container. And prior to that, it, no one would ever try to skip that encounter leaving the heart container square. Um, and so there's stuff like that. There's also uh, a runner did a bunch of analysis on the pee bag drops, and there's the the skeleton at the top of the elevator in. Um, palace one that you would kill after getting the candle and he found i forget the what the frame number is but there's a frame that if you kill that enemy on the, this specific frame uh you have a 100 percent chance of getting a pee bag and so there's some of these little minor manipulations with the rng that we've discovered uh through messing around with some of that stuff and uh yeah the same person who did that uh uh research into the P-bag drop on that Stalfos, uh, started analyzing the spawn patterns of Karak, and we know that there are only 64 different patterns that can appear, um, but I don't know that anyone's only done any crunching. Yeah. <laughs> it, that, that's a pretty new finding, is just a couple days ago, posted in the Discord. Oh, interesting. Um, so I don't know if anyone's done any uh, crunching of the numbers to figure out like if there's a more optimal place to stand than in the far right corner of the room or whatever. Uh, so we may see some new strats develop for the Karak fight in the future. I don't even know if your movements in that room affect the RNG or if it I, is just on a fixed cycle based on the global timer when you enter. I'm fairly certain it's uh, based on the RNG uh, seed, which that increments every frame um, on a... it's. It's a known algorithm for how that RNG changes, but uh, um, yeah, it's as far as I know, it's based off of that. It may be like masking some of the bits to determine which, because there's probably I don't know exactly how many spaces it can spawn, but I I don't know if it can spawn literally anywhere or if it's like only on certain x coordinates that it can spawn. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, and I'm chuckling because during the break, folks, we were talking about how optimized speedrunning can get nowadays compared to where it was you know, just six or seven years ago. And the fact that, you know, we've analyzed and we're kind of aware of the algorithm and how it, <laughs> it affects yeah. the RNG of the game uh, is no, kind of mind-blowing, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've, I'm pretty familiar with the, um, the ROM, like the ROM image and what the assembly is saying that it's doing in different places and stuff. Like when we, when we get to Palace Six, I've got some fun information about how Barbo works. But <laughs> well, I mean, would you mind sharing? I, I you know, I, we're, we've gotten through quite a bit here, and I'm curious yeah. how you know. Let's keep it going. <laughs> so, well, one thing we've discovered, uh, and I, I'm sure Fiesel knew this at the time of this run with Barba. If you go into the room and don't stop until the screen stops scrolling, uh, then 100 percent of the time, Barbo will spawn in the far right pit. Um, and we, we know that, and that's, uh, that comes from when each time you enter a new room, uh, the RNG resets to a known state, but then it starts, uh, well, the first bite of the RNG resets to a known state. <laughs> wow. And so, because um, it's, it's like, uh, 
I don't know, it's like a six or eight byte long string and it just keeps doing a bit shift and with some modification. And so basically only the first, I want to say it's like 12 bits of the whole RNG sequence, it matters for what's going to change in the future. And so based on that, the way it always lines up that, uh, that uh, Barba spawns in the far right pit 100% of the time if you don't stop the screen from scrolling. Uh, but then there are two other places that it can spawn because there's three pits on the screen. And the way that the game does that is it has a lookup table uh, where, and it just takes three bits, which gives you a number between zero and seven. So looks up in an eight element array, which one to go to. And so it's Three entries for pit one, two entries for pit two, and three entries for pit three. So it actually uh, is least likely to spawn in the center pit. I have to imagine as a math fan, it's fun uh, discovering some of these <laughs> things that exist in the game. Yeah, uh, it's... <sighs> it, it was really cool when I was reading the code and, and figured out exactly how that worked. <laughs> Fiesel, did you have any sort of knowledge about as you're going to, I mean, it's, I think it's an ex-palace, but did you have any of that, that knowledge uh, for, as far as the barber fight goes before you did it? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know the specifics. I knew that if you keep moving, if you keep the screen scrolling, you can control the first place that Barbara's going to spawn, you know, as, as Ian said. And then I guess my philosophy was, well, just try to kill Barbara the first time <laughs> so you don't have to worry about where, where it goes next. But, you know, easier yeah. said than done. There was a comment earlier in the chat, and basically this category is don't die, go fast. <laughs> you know, yes. Sounds right. Sounds about yeah, right. It's, that's category. most categories, unless right. you're taking an intentional death abuse. <laughs> Which is why there's differentiation of categories. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty. It, it's one of the things that I, I've really appreciated about a lot of different speedruns, and this is kind of where I think GDQ kind of fits into, into the, 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 the overall, you know, story of speedrunning is that with Z2, it's one of those games where if you watch the GDQ runs from, you know, 10 to 13 to 12, you know, all, all these through the years, you can really see the evolution of where the speed run has gone. And I think that's one thing GDQ does really well is highlights the evolution of the strats and the routing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and we talked about it, Ian, with your run, with your No Major Glitches run from just a, a little bit ago, because it really highlights where the game has gone. You, we've broken it apart where you can take on <laughs> the final boss uh, yes. as one of the first things you do in the game, which is just kind of wild and mind-blowing if you think about it yeah that it's pretty I, awesome that's my favorite category by far the reverse boss order <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and that's one where like you're on the edge of your seat pretty much the entire run because it can it can go south pr at pretty much any point like i mean after the guma fight that's when i breathe a, a big sigh of relief because that's like the thunderbird fight and the guma fight are the two like hardest parts of that run <laughs> <laughs> it, how many how many hits is the uh, is the, those I mean those just take so many hits to get through those two bosses. So yeah, it's at attack four. It's thirty two hits on um, uh, Thunderbird, and then uh, I would be fighting Guma at attack five, and so that's I believe sixteen hits. But I don't I don't. It's been a little bit since I've run the category, so I don't quite remember. But I I want to say it's sixteen hits at attack five. So. That, and that reminds me, so Breakdown, when you first ran this way back when in 2010, were you aware of some of those spawns that could happen or some of the, I'm sorry, some of the RNG elements that could happen in boss fights and things like that? Not mathematically, certainly. <laughs> like, um, definitely, like, I don't know, people was talking about save state practice. I didn't even do save state practice when I was initially <laughs> granting out this game. I was playing on the GameCube Collector's Edition with a GameCube controller. Oh, man. And, um, yeah, no, my computer set up, like, I didn't have, like, a computer controller, so I would be a keyboard warrior, and this is a terrible game to be a keyboard warrior <laughs> on because uh, left plus right just makes you zip across the screen like a crazy person. So, yeah, um... I mean, I had, like, you know, just, like, anecdotal and, like, observational evidence, but in terms of, like, you know, like, right. I definitely couldn't be, like, okay, it's drawing from this table, and then there's three <laughs> bits that do this, and then, like, right. you know, kids, like, gotta divide by 27, and you have this many odds to do this. No, like, none of that was figuring into the way I approach the game. Um, but that just kind of serves to show how speedrunning in general has evolved. Mm. It's, uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier um, in the green room, actually, just how, like, there's a more... Um, 
systematic and almost mechanical approach to um, how games work these days. And there's so many people just dedicated to not necessarily like perfecting strats, but just figuring out how things work in a game um, to the betterment of the overall finished product of the run. Definitely, because the more you understand why things work, the better you can approach how to do things. And that's just very, very evident in the conversation we're having here today. I'm glad you brought that up break, breakdown because that's one of the things that I really appreciate and think is such a, an interesting and strength of the speedrunning community is that let's say you're the type of person that enjoys going frame by frame, <laughs> you know, working on a computer, being meticulous, taking a month to figure something out. You you, you know, you can pursue tool assisted speedrunning. If you're the type of person that enjoys routing and there are still games that have not been routed out there, you can spend the time and find new ways. If you enjoy glitch hunting, you can go and, and go find, see if you can figure out a new way to break a game. If you just enjoy, you know, putting on the best demonstration of the skills that are involved in doing the game, you can do so with, with you know, a good old RTA speedrun. And I think that's, uh, you know, with the growth of the community, I think that's one of its biggest positive and biggest strengths is that no matter how you want to enjoy or to, to partake in a game, there are these options out there for you. And I think it's, it's really great highlighting some of these early runs to see how it was done. You know, even, I mean, realistically 2013 wasn't that long ago you know <laughs> like you know, even though in speed writing time it feels like it's a lifetime ago at this point and so to see where it's come from and all these opportunities that are if you want to get involved in this at all you really can and i think that's a, a really great and wonderful aspect to this whole thing uh, uh if you're like eod and, and you know more about math than i could ever possibly understand like there's there are things that you could pursue it too as well which i think is really cool <laughs> Um, is there anything I'm missing, Fiesel, or any behind-the-scenes story that I might be missing from this time period as far as the Zelda 2 stuff goes? I really feel like we've caught a lot. Mm. Zelda 2 stuff. Around this, um, I mean, I think we pretty much covered it all. I do want to shout out Bad Breaks for finding a lot of cool stuff in this game. Uh, he would come, you know, in and out of this game, and every time he would start working hard on this game... He would just send me like a dozen videos of brand new strats that he found. Like, I don't know, a lot of, like his contribution to it needs to be recognized, I think, too. Yeah, I would say Lord of Ultima as well did a lot with, Oh yeah. Um, particularly some of those RNG manipulation stuff with, with the overworld uh, spawns and stuff like that. I'm glad to hear you give those people a shout out because it's, it's not quite often that we hear, you know, all of that stuff that happened behind the scenes to get where we are today. So thank you for doing that. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to start wrapping it up there. I, I honestly can't thank you all so much for taking us down this road and taking us down memory lane. It's, it's, I know for a lot of us who grew up with Zelda games, Zelda 1 and 2 specifically, these games, at least for me, opened up my mind to the world of possibilities to video games. Don't get me wrong. I loved Mario, loved Mega Man, loved all those type of games. But the idea of the, the, Zelda just seemed to open up this world, this imaginary world that you could actually participate in. And that's one of the things I still enjoy about the Zelda games today, that they, you know, they really capture, if you will, a child, my, my childhood imagination. So, uh, and, and had I, you know, these, these runs hadn't, had we not had games done quick back then or other ways of viewing speed runs, I'm not sure I'd still be, I'd be involved. So it's pretty awesome to see where it's come from. Uh, breakdown, any final thoughts? I mean, you've, we've seen you on so many couches <laughs> over the years. Uh, what's it like to, to see GDQ where it's at today? Uh, it's kind of mind-blowing, honestly. Um, I got to say, like, the earlier events that we've been highlighting here, like, you know, like, 2015, 2013, 2010, <laughs> like, those are those are special to me, that era of GDQ. It's, you know, like, um, from, like, an organization standpoint, we were still figuring things out, but they always came together in such a great way, and it was always such a good time. And, you know, going back and watching these VODs, it, like, definitely is a nostalgia trip for me. So, um, but, I mean, hey, I'm going to keep on keeping on. Uh, just uh, over inside of a month until uh, the next online event, and, um, yeah, looking forward to that, certainly. So here's to many more after that. I know I've asked you about this before, but was there any possible way of seeing the growth of GDQ? I mean, being there at the very first one and seeing where it's at today? Um, I would never have guessed it would have come as far as it did, but I'm glad it did, certainly. Um, it's a great thing to have been a part of over the years and to continue to be a part of. And, yeah, like I said before, here's to many more. 
Fiesel, we've seen you move from the runner's, you know, space into commentary. I mean, written, rarely uh, GDQs go by where we don't see you uh, on the microphone, you know, uh, interviewing people and things like that. Uh, uh, what's it like seeing the growth, I mean, from your perspective, Fiesel? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's tough It's tough to, to really pinpoint, uh, like, like, any spot where I really saw the growth because it was just so gradual at every <laughs> step of the way, you know, it was just a light increase over the last time around and it's only when you kind of look back and just see if, how far it came that it really starts to look impressive but um i mean certainly moving into like the hotels and like as the you know from you know 4-h center and moving into better hotels or bigger hotels and then just seeing that the just the equipment get upgraded year after year and the layout looking nicer year after year so i mean little things like that you certainly notice but um yeah, I mean, it all kind of just ramped up smoothly, really, as, as streaming really started to take off and Twitch really, you know, became big. Eon, we've seen you uh, n numerous times performing varying different games here on the GDQ stage and also uh, Zelda 2. If there, if somebody was interested in this game, um, where would be like a good place to start? What would be like a run they may want to, what would be a good place to, you know, if they, somebody wanted to pick up yeah. this speed run? So there's uh, a couple of places. We do have a... Um, community speedrun discord and we have all kinds of resources available there um i don't know if there's a link available somewhere on that but uh that's a thing you can you know reach out to anyone speedrunning the game they'll be able to hand you that there's also uh redcandle.us has um a lot of good information about speedrunning both zelda 1 and zelda 2 and then uh we have a new community wiki that is still kind of in the works, so uh, a lot of information is still missing from it, but at bindingforce.net, uh, which is a reference to, uh, in the instruction manual, the Great Barrier at the entrance to uh, the Great Palace is referred to as the Binding Force. So, Some great links, and we'll include some of those in the description so we can send people in the right place. I really do appreciate that. And that was, by the way, a good save right there, Fiesel, on uh, <laughs> I got that yes. bridge at <laughs> this point of the video. Um, I, you know, Breakdown, is there any place people can find you? If, if you, I, I don't know how much you stream nowadays or anything like that, but uh, if you, is there anything you'd be interested if you want to link somewhere? Uh, my streams are sporadic, certainly, um, and usually are variety projects that eventually turn into at least somewhat speedrunning projects. That seems to be the way I roll these days. Um, but uh, you can find me on Twitch at uh, Breakdown777. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, Breakdown SDA. And yeah, that's what I got. Fiesel, how about you? Anything with the uh, speed game or anything else else you'd like to link us to or, or, or send people a place to see more stuff? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm Fiesel on Twitch if you want to watch any of my old VODs. Um, right now, most of my work is in uh, speed gaming, also on Twitch. Fish TV oh. speed gaming, that's what I'm doing most of right now. And uh, I don't know, just just enjoying life. Awesome. Eon, where can people find you if they're all interested in this? Or <laughs> Tetris the Grandmaster, I want to give some shout out to yeah. that. Where, where oh, can yeah. people find you on Twitch? Uh, I'll get to that. One second, I want to point out there was a very rare thing that just happened on the screen. Fiesel oh, got a fairy spawn in the Valley of Death here, and that's a 1 in 256 chance to get a fairy spawn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but yeah, so awesome. uh, my you can find me on Twitch and Twitter both at Eon Heck. That's E-O-N-H-C-K. Uh, no E in there because we don't want to be vulgar. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I do a lot of Zelda 2 and Tetris the Grandmaster. I've kind of been focused a bit more on uh, Tetris lately. Uh, streams have been kind of sporadic, but uh, should be picking back up with frequency soon, so... Well, thank you all so much for joining here today. And thank you out there, folks, for watching and being here and uh, spending a little bit of time as we relive, relive some classic games done quick moments. Thanks, everyone, for listening, watching, viewing, liking, subscribing, and sharing. All of that stuff goes a long way to helping out the podcast. If you'd like any additional info, you can go to sequencebreakpodcast.com. All of our past episodes, everything's on there. You'll find everything there. If you'd like to watch live, follow the Sequence Break Twitter. That is Sequence Break PC, and you can join in, ask some questions, watch the whole thing live. It does happen. It's not really a set time, but I do post when I go live. Everything else, if you have any questions or anything like that, podcast podcast at sequencebreakpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next one.